Today's topic will include themes of grooming and sexual abuse, which some listeners may find disturbing or triggering. We encourage all listeners to prioritize their own mental health and well-being and to only engage with this content if you feel you are able. Dissonant dialogues sometimes means difficult dialogues, and this topic may be our most difficult so far. So if you won't be joining us today, we see you, we love you, and feel free to check out our other episodes. Most importantly, Dissonant Dialogues is never disrespectful. We strive to create a safe community of classical musicians and people who love them to talk about the uncomfortable realities of the music world. We ask that you avoid speculation about any undisclosed identities or making assumptions about what actions may or may not have been taken in the aftermath of the abuse. Most importantly, victim blaming, harassment, objectification, trolling, or shaming will not ever be tolerated on our platforms. This is for both our safety and the safety of our audience. Please do not hesitate to report inappropriate comments or bring them to Claire's attention, specifically to Claire's attention. She is at undeadmezzo on Instagram. When it comes to our season finale and this bonus episode being related to the abuse that I and we faced, Claire's been handling the comment section, so I do not have to witness or see any of the harassment that may be directed towards me. Hello everyone and welcome to Dissonant Dialogues. I am Emily and today I actually do not have Claire here with me today uh, because this is going to be a solo bonus episode of In Between Seasons. So at this point we've probably already announced that season two will be coming. Uh, I never thought I would be doing a solo episode. Claire brought that up before. She's like, we could, we should try like solo episodes too, like just for a little like bonus thing. And I was like, Claire, I can't. <laughs> but uh, it kind of fell into place where there's something that's very meaningful to me. And um, before I start an incredibly difficult workload and don't have time to um, work on all this advocacy stuff that I'm really strong and passionate about, I figured that this would be a good time to film this now um, and really just let myself feel being a survivor is lonely because of the perpetrators. It shouldn't be. There's so many numbers. There shouldn't be that many numbers of survivors, but unfortunately there are. So we shouldn't be alone. We should be together and we should be working to find our own justice and to heal. So season two will be coming out starting October 5th, and the eight episodes of the season will be released every other Saturday. We have some interesting topics submitted by our listeners and some really exciting guests. So stay tuned because this is all the stuff that you asked for and some really great guests that both Claire and I found to talk about some really interesting stuff. Following our season finale about my story with psychological grooming, I wanted to give a bonus episode between seasons featuring my victim impact statement. This was written as a therapeutic exercise, and I would like to share it with other listening ears, especially those who uh, are interested in learning about the impact that psychological grooming and essay can have on a victim, uh, and just what it's like dealing with the PTSD, uh, the aftermath of your victim yourself, and you're interested in writing a victim impact statement, and you want to hear what one sounds like. Now, this is very personal to me. Um, I believe that other victims of both psychological grooming and sexual abuse can relate to this in their own ways. And I think this is a moment for us to really just sit down and listen to the impact that this can truly have on a victim. Because I think so many people um, don't dig deep down and really understand the kind of effect that this abuse has on an individual. And I think that my victim impact statement really does convey that well. So thank you for your support and for listening. And we look forward to seeing you in season two uh, with a bundle of special guests and topics that you requested. But for now, here's my victim impact statement. According to the United States Department of Justice, victim impact statements describe the emotional, physical, and financial impact you and others have suffered as a direct result of the crime. Survivors are forced to make our own justice, heal ourselves, and somehow function in everyday life again. My victim impact statement is just one tiny element of the closure I have been searching for on my own. It is not that the justice system is broken, it's that it doesn't exist. I did not receive the opportunity to read my statement, but like all survivors, it deserves to be heard. I came to conservatory excited to learn and passionate about music. I had achieved my highest goal so far in life, earning the opportunity to enter a high-level conservatory 
paired with a violin teacher who was internationally known for her successful students in a gorgeous city that rang with a multitude of opportunities. I didn't know that my excitement to learn, my nerdy love for music theory, us sharing the same favorite composer, would all grab your attention in a way that put my life and my safety in danger. I didn't know my mom's sudden cancer diagnosis, my home life and childhood, my career risking overuse injury, the COVID-19 pandemic isolation as a first time college student, my trust in teachers as safe adults, my trust in schools as safe places, and my Catholic faith would all make me vulnerable to your abuse. I sometimes wonder that if I didn't go to that school, it would have never happened. But the truth is people like you are everywhere. Someone else would have chosen me. And for you, well, it would have just happened to the next vulnerable student under your power. Unlearning the psychological grooming you put me through is the worst. I have to fight my own brain every day, trying to understand why you did what you did. You knew I had a history of abuse. You threatened to expel me from school if I didn't tell you about it. You then manipulated me into thinking you were trying to take the trauma out of me, but you took me out of the trauma you were crafting. You opened every scar I had carefully patched from my past to make me vulnerable again, while making new and bigger wounds. You are the reason that innocence can't exist because innocence equals vulnerability. You can't survive and be innocent, otherwise you'll be assaulted. That's the reality of being a girl. You chiseled away at me to make me vulnerable and put a lot of thought and time into it. You fabricated insecurities that I didn't have beforehand, that I was broken because of a history of abuse, that I couldn't be gay, that my chest was too small, that no one could love me or respect me because of my slim body and my blonde hair. There are a lot of conversations and memories that are involved in grooming. It's constant triggers, it's constant flashbacks, it's constant nightmares, it's constant tears. It's constant grief. I live with that constant grief now. You begged for pictures, videos, and audio recordings of me practicing what you claimed you had to teach me because according to you, something was wrong with me. I was too attractive to not understand your flagrant sex jokes, to have never had the sex talk, to not be as interested in talking about sex as you were with me. You wanted to give me the talk to help protect me, you claimed. You belittled me, you made fun of my insecurities, you called me broken, and you tried balancing this with occasional compliments and filling me with hope that one day I'd be enough and have my own boyfriend. You tried to alter my sexuality, you threatened me, you yelled and cursed me out until I gave in. I remember the first time I gave in to that audio recording. I was sitting in my tiny pink bed in my dorm. My heart was racing and my head was on fire. You made me feel like I was going crazy. You were blowing up my phone, every word breaking down my mind and body. When I hit send, I threw my phone across the room and cried for hours. You were slowly taking pieces of me, and soon you were going to take my body too. Despite any signs pointing to your abuse furthering, I didn't believe that because I trusted you. The many times you assaulted me during the spring semester of my junior year come back in flashes, but I can still vividly remember the first time it happened, what you did and how I felt. I want to describe that to you and everyone now. I came into your office that day very upset. My pet I had owned since I started living alone at college passed away. My best friend was not only talking to me when she wanted me to send her the answers to our homework. My family was no longer talking to me. Your wife now hated me because of the abuse you were putting both of us through slowly turning two women who had been friends against each other. You had finally isolated me, so the only person I had was you. I was vulnerable and alone at only your hands, and that is when you chose to strike. I sat in your office, crying about all of the things falling apart in my life because of you. How did you respond? You asked if I was still touching myself, if I had been successful, your term for orgasm. I angrily spat back that I wasn't doing that ever again. I wasn't interested, I didn't like it, and that it hurt. That didn't stop you. You said that I must not have known where my clit was, in your words. Apparently, with all the experience in sex ed you claimed you had, you told me that you didn't know what the clitoris looked like, only what it felt like. I kept saying no over and over, but that word meant nothing to you. 
You sent me an article about a married woman in her 40s who was broken and lost, claiming she was me because she didn't know where her clitoris was and needed someone experienced in sex to show her. You took her story and stuck me in her vulnerable shoes and you in the shoes of the one in power and control. You wore me down after weeks of you begging that I gave in, hoping that after you'd stop everything and it would never happen again. You stood behind me, pulling me in tightly. I jumped to the touch, but you just told me to relax. How could I relax when I was alone in your office, the door locked with your hands on my body? You stretched forward my leggings and underwear, sliding your hand into my pants. You made yourself completely comfortable, resting your head on my shoulder and fiddling around in my pants for way longer than you needed to. You spent so long trying to find the clitoris that you claimed to know so well that I had almost found my silent voice to ask if you found it yet. That's when you whispered, that's it. I tried to pull away, but you held me in your tight grip against your body, continually moving your hand in circles and asking questions. Does this feel good? How would you feel about climaxing in my office? I said I was done and I would never want to do that, but you moved your hand faster and started kissing my neck, tightening your grip on me so I couldn't get away. I kept trying to pull away and telling you that I had to go when you finally began to release me, but slowly. I still vividly remember the way that you slowly drew your hand from between my legs up my stomach before finally releasing your tight grip. You asked for a hug like you always did. You made that the norm. I just wanted something to be normal and safe, so I agreed. I felt so uncomfortable about what had just happened that I diminished back into my child self, turning around and giggling, backwards hug. My childish demeanor turned you around even more and you pulled me sharply into your body. That's when I felt it against my butt. You had an erection. My professor had an erection against me. There I was being held against you after the uncomfortable encounter that had just happened and trying to process all of the lies you had told me that this was just my sex education, that it was a chore for you, that I owed you for all the times you spent teaching me your version of sex education, that it was just to help me, that you could never be turned on by someone as young as me, someone who you thought of as your daughter. You lifted up my shirt and my bra very quickly and kept your hands floating up above my chest. Can I touch them, you asked, despite me saying no, despite me saying that you would never, ever do that to me and that I trusted you. You took that as a dare. You took that as a challenge. And despite me saying no and trying to push away, you did it anyway. Oops, you said with a quick squeeze to both of my breasts. We both knew the oops was a lie too. I pushed you away fast and covered myself, but it didn't matter because the damage was done. That was only the start to the rest of the semester's sexual abuse in your office. That would only get much worse. I don't need to describe all the other assaults that took place in your office that semester. This is enough for now. The police know, I know, but most importantly, you know. Regardless of how much denial you have coded over your memory of what happened behind your locked office door. I would like to describe the triggers that I now have because of you that I didn't have before. Banana used to be my favorite flavor, but I can't eat my favorite banana flavored yogurt anymore. I buy bananas every week at the grocery store because I know they're good for me, but they just sit there and rot. It's a never ending cycle. I had to throw away my coffee candle because the smell of coffee reminds me of your office. Whenever I hear anyone saying your wife's name or I read it in a book, my heart races and I start to shake because of the way you used to yell it in my face, blaming me for you cheating on your wife while you claimed I didn't fight back hard enough to stop you when you couldn't stop yourself. Whenever I see a man that looks like you, I freeze, searching their face and demeanor to see if it's you. I see all men with your characteristics as predators and rapists now, and just seeing one sets me into a PTSD episode. I feel sick to my stomach when I see a man in dress clothes, dress pants, dress shirts, ties, hearing a man's belt click, reminding me of you ripping off your belt and throwing down your pants. Because once that happened, I knew you wouldn't stop until you were done. I'm scared of every vehicle I see that even slightly resembles yours. And when you have something to fear, it multiplies. 
Every time I leave my apartment, I am searching vehicle windows for your face, fearful you are coming to stalk me or that your wife finally escaped you and that you decided to get your revenge on me. I am sickened by the carpeting that resembles your office carpet. It's all over the university that I paid thousands of dollars to attend that now follows you into my nightmares. I'm afraid of locks on doors, especially when there are multiple locks on doors like yours. My hands shake when I have to close or lock a door when there was someone else in the room with me. You have left visible, permanent marks on my body. I see the scars every day. They are a reminder that I've survived your abuse, but also a reminder of the abuse. You may have not held the blade yourself, but you cut me. These scars belong to you. I just have to carry them on my body. You are no longer in my life, but you still manage to be a part of it. You show up in my nightmares every single night. I don't get a moment of peace during the day or night when I'm trying to recharge and escape the dark world you've created for me. I had to start medication for the nightmares that make me groggy and give me headaches just to survive. Don't get me started on the many medications I tried out of desperation during your abuse. I experienced daily flashbacks of the glazed look you had over your face when you claimed you needed to go all the way and couldn't stop. I've never had violent thoughts before, but when I can't get that image out of my head, it makes me want to gouge my eyes out and brain in hopes that then I will be able to forget. You weren't just someone who sexually assaulted me. You took advantage of and ruined every single aspect of the things I was passionate about. You weren't just a professor. You were a professor in one of my favorite subjects of my degrees. Techniques I have learned are now tainted. You taught me the three little pigs theory for how composers write music. You taught me all of the steps on how to write and dictate melodic dictations. You taught me how to analyze harmony. These things I will carry with me now and forever in my career. Your abuse will always haunt me in everything that I do for the rest of my life. You taught me that school is a dark place. You taught me that church is a dark place where your faith and trust in God can be manipulated and used against you. You taught me to never trust men. You taught me that no one is safe. The university I worked hard for admission and was excited for has been tainted with your abuse. You acted from a place where you believed you were entitled to my body, my career, my source of making money. You compromised my ability to do the work that I qualified for with years of specialized training to do this job, which every musician would agree is extremely difficult. And now you've made it almost impossible for me to do. We're not just talking about a body that you compromised here, but my future, my financial security, my career, my passion. I quit two jobs because of your abuse. One I had been working at for three years and the other I was recommended for. An annual summer camp I had taught for three years was the one job I hadn't lost. A week of work out of an entire year might not seem like much, but after you took away everything else I had, it meant everything to me. I was fired from this job because I spoke out publicly about being a survivor and because of my PTSD diagnosis, claiming my ability to work was compromised. Musicians and organizations label me as the whistleblower before labeling you as the abuser. No one wants to work with those who have been sexually assaulted. It makes them uncomfortable. They don't know how to handle it, so they just eliminated me from the equation. These three jobs were all building my resume, gaining me financial independence, and bringing me joy. I had to stop working for over a year while I took intensive trauma therapy to reach a place of just barely functioning from your abuse. I lost all the money I had made and more. When I was a child, I always wanted to save my money and put it in the bank. I was never a spender. While I used to be ahead in saving my money, I remain in a body that is traumatized and over 60,000 in debt. You gave me my first taste of what sexual assault and PTSD discrimination feels like. I blame the camp for firing me, but I also blame you for putting me in this position. I continue to struggle understanding the world I live in when I question these circumstances. How was I fired for being a sexual assault survivor, but you were never fired for sexually assaulting me? My sentence is for life, and you'll never get one. If I'm not worth it, was this worth it? Filing a police report 
retelling my story time after time to lawyers, officers, and detectives. I was re-traumatized and harassed and told I was lying about the worst experience of my life. All that for nothing. I got sentenced for life and you walked free. You told me that your favorite cadence was a Phrygian half. For those who haven't studied music theory, a Phrygian half is a sad sounding minor chord, which then leads to a dominant chord, which are unresolved chords full of tension, also known as an unresolved cadence, an unresolved ending. You must enjoy this then. Another unresolved case of sexual abuse that you walk away freely from. I now have to bear the title as not only your victim, but as your survivor, because you didn't kill me. I wish that you murdered me when you were done with my body. When you handed me the scissors in your office and told me to kill myself, I wish that you just did it right there. I hate having to live with what you did every single day. Sexual assault is more than murder because it kills your soul and you have to continue functioning in that vandalized body afterwards. Sexual assault doesn't kill the body, but the body isn't who the person is. Your soul is who you are and who is destroyed by the crime. When someone is murdered, we don't grieve their body. We grieve the person. That's what sexual assault is. It kills the person. Although I have to bear this title as a victim and survivor, both of which I never asked for, I want to name the labels that you bear. You are a predator. You are an abuser. Not only to me, but to your wife and kids. You and I both know what secretly happens inside your home and what happened to me behind that office door. Since you claim to believe in God, remember that no matter how much you try to deny your actions and behavior to yourself and others, God is a witness. You can't lie to him. You can't hide from or bury the truth. You are a robber. According to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, the definition of a robbery is to take something away from a person or place in secrecy or by force, threat, or trickery. You robbed me of my body, my safety, my career, and my sense of self. You took through methods of psychological grooming. You are a murderer. You killed every element of who I used to be. Everything about me that used to exist is now gone. I changed my hair. I got mixed with alcohol with your encouragement. I lost my passion for music. I lost my confidence and energy as a teacher. My favorite color has changed. I was going to change my name legally until I realized it would cost me more money that I no longer have. My entire identity has changed. You killed who I was and selfishly left me alive to bear the aftermath of your abuse. That is the worst torture of all. I'm not excited to go to school like I used to be. I'm not excited to learn anymore. Classrooms used to be bright and safe, and now they're dark and dangerous. How could I ever feel safe being myself again when you took advantage of my academic enthusiasm? Since your abuse, all of my teachers have been critiquing me the same way. They tell me I'm great at the violin and the cello, conducting, in terms of my technical ability, but I don't show emotion. I don't open up and become vulnerable with the audience anymore. I've been labeled stiff and protective of myself when I perform because I fear showing my vulnerabilities to someone else again. I never believed it could have been you that would hurt me, so it really could be anyone. My music education advisor told me that when I stand in front of a classroom orchestra, I correct all the right things. I have all the right ideas. It's not in the fundamentals, but it's purely in the confidence. The confidence I used to have before you. I have to constantly convince myself that I'm much stronger than you made me feel to just get through the bare minimum. It's exhausting being alive now. After you, I have spoken publicly about being a survivor of psychological grooming and sexual assault. I bring awareness to sexual assault online. I have a podcast that talks about abuse in the classical music industry, and I will always speak openly for survivors. I have always had a voice. You stripped it from me and I had to work to get it back, but I always had it. I do not owe you any of my strength, my success, my becoming. You did not create me. The only credit you can take is for manipulating and assaulting me. And you won't even admit to that yourself. 
instead justifying your actions as help and simply being a man wanting to get some. Whatever I become, whoever I become, I owe you nothing. Nothing you have done to me can or will be forgiven. You can continue going to church every week, even every day, but I will never forgive you. This repeated eternal sin is unforgivable. You made a conscious and willful choice to continue for two years of choosing evil over good. A refusal to repent and knowingly sin is unforgivable. The definition of a victim impact statement asks you to describe not only how the crime impacted you, but others. Although it seems since my story went public, all anyone ever cared about was anyone except me. I believe that this victim impact statement should finally be something that is solely about me, but I will follow the rules and talk about how what you did to me affected more than just me. I was not the only student you betrayed. Every single student that you have taught has had their trust shattered and now has to question how and why they didn't see the signs earlier. They have to feel guilty that they didn't report you when you made sexual comments to them and touched them inappropriately. They feel like their entire experience in conservatory was all a lie because they fell for your psychological grooming and the fake act you gave to the public. Every single student that you have ever taught and spoken to now has to question their entire reality and conservatory experience. What was supposed to be one of the most happy and fun times of their lives has now deadened to a sickening feeling of dark questions and an acceptance of a new reality. All these young, fresh, and excited minds now share a piece of my trauma that you have caused as they try to navigate how to move forward accepting who you really are and what you did. Your colleagues that you've worked with are either in such denial that they don't believe me or in so much shock that they're struggling to function themselves. The entire school is trying to navigate and understand how they fell for your psychological grooming and lies over the decades that you worked there. Trying to understand how and why you did what you did can make somebody feel like they're going crazy. I know this personally as I have spent years trying to justify and understand every aspect of your psychological grooming and sexual abuse. There is no end to justifying or understanding it because things of such a dark nature could never make sense. The day I filed the police report, I was accompanied by a friend and another former officer of law enforcement for support. My friend had to give up hours of her day to hear the horrific details of what she did to me. The policeman drove two hours from another state to accompany me to make sure that no officer took advantage of me. After describing what you did to me and answering the police officer's detailed questions at the station, I can guarantee that no one in that room slept good that night. Your actions have changed people forever. When I reported, the first people that people were worried about were your wife and children. I should have been the one of concern because I was your victim. Your wife knew about the sexual abuse and she enabled it. She is your accomplice. I do believe that she deserves an element of sympathy because she was also groomed and abused by you. But in my story, she is at fault for enabling the sexual and emotional abuse I endured at both of your hands. I never mattered to you or to your wife. You both knew I was perfect to satisfy the urges you couldn't contain to lessen your chances of hurting another young girl and to take the sexual burden off of your wife's shoulders. I never mattered to the university. Two deans and many other students saw what you were doing, but stayed quiet until I reported. When I reported to Title IX, the school protected you. They gave you 90 to 120 days to remain employed, giving you an out which you cowardly took. They gave you your pension, allegedly. You got paid thousands of dollars for sexually assaulting me. I dealt with unfair treatment and harassment from students in the university my entire senior year when you were no longer there to be harassed. When it wasn't you hurting me, it was them. I never mattered to my own lawyers. They only cared about compensation and reputation. I never mattered to law enforcement or the justice system. The only name I was told I am good for is star witness, not victim who deserves justice. I never mattered to God. 
I sat in that pew next to you and your wife until the sexual abuse got so bad that I couldn't take it any longer and stopped going. But every time I sat in that church, God did nothing to help me escape you. He quietly watched the show he created. I never mattered to anyone. The final question I will leave you with to contemplate is deceptively simple. What about me?